Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2023, the summer of Trek. <laughs> this is a BookTube event created by Vin at Revenant Reads. He assembled a multi species bridge crew <laughs> of other BookTubers in order to talk about Star Trek fiction all summer long. The glorious, languid dog days of summer, the days that I associate with Star Trek. Uh, not only because I spent an entire summer in Iowa watching Star Trek III several times every day. <laughs> several times every day, I broke up my day between watching Star Trek III in the movie theater with air conditioning and swimming laps in an Olympic-sized pool. That's all I did all that summer long, <laughs> and read on the, on the balcony. Uh, but also because that's when I've watched all the other Star Trek movies. That's uh, what's when I, I most have most fond memories of reading them and rereading the old paperbacks. Uh, so I'm glad. I'm glad that the, the summer of Trek is is happening. I don't know what shape mine will take. It, I'm going to do a lot of Star Trek reading this summer, and June is only halfway done. We have all of July and all of August. I imagine that in that time, I will hit dull spots. I imagine that in that time, I will decide to dedicate a whole week at a time to rereading old favorites, or maybe two weeks at a time. Uh, maybe I'll voyage into fanfiction.net. A lot of you have asked me to go looking in fanfiction.net, see if I can find anything that's worth talking about. I might do that. That seems a perfectly fun thing to do. But at the moment, I am just spinning the roulette wheel uh, every night when I set up my nightly reading. I'm adding, I'm adding Star Trek and Westerns and a couple of other things to my nightly reading and uh, not making a plan. So I did that this time around. I hit on something that I'm pretty sure I have already read. I think I read everything in this series. I picked, uh, for this time around, uh, Strange New Worlds number 9. And Strange New Worlds number 9 is not uh, the new Star Trek iteration of the, uh, the adventures of the Enterprise under Captain Pike. This is not that. <laughs> this is an anthology series. I picked number 9, this one here, which is computer-generated. You've got uh, Starship's clashing there with an explosion, and notice the only number on the, the uh, registry is the number nine. <laughs> That's how they work in the number nine for this thing. Uh, and uh, these were anthologies of original Star Trek stories made by uh, fans, by non-professional writers. There was a contest, you got uh, distribution, you got uh, promotion, you got, uh, I think, cash money. And I, I, when Stranger Worlds number one came out, I had a melancholy smile on my face because I very much remember the visceral thrill of Star Trek The New Voyages, one and two, by Sondra Barshek and Myrna Kalbreth 50 years ago, which was essentially the same thing. It was an anthology of stories by amateurs or pros or semi-pros just writing about Star Trek. Very difficult thing to do then. Then for a long while it was completely impossible to do for just legal reasons. And now, for a while, when these books were coming out every year, it was possible to do. And I don't remember if number nine... Number nine is getting up there. I don't think this series went on for too much longer than this. But number was one, two, three, and four, I gobbled up. I just gobbled them up. Then after a while, I think around number five, I started to notice that not all the stories were very good. You know, and... I had a long conversation with myself, <laughs> or maybe with a room full of beagles, about how when Star Trek New Voyages and Star Trek New Voyages 2 came out 50 years ago, I idolatrously read and memorized all of those stories because I thought Star Trek needed the help, that Star Trek needed a boost because there was nothing else. But now that Star Trek is a multi-billion dollar franchise and there's lots and lots of Star Trek fiction out there. After a while, after volume three or four or five of this series, I started realizing, well, Star Trek doesn't need the boost anymore and these volumes don't have enough good stuff in them to warrant me continuing to read them when I buy them and read them when I can go on fanfiction.net or sites like it and read Star Trek fiction for free. That's not any bit worse. Uh, so I may have quit before Star Trek Nine. I, ha I have to say... Uh, Nothing in here rang a bell, so I don't think I've read this before. Uh, and this is the same thing as Strange New Worlds. They even have rules. They, at the back of every volume, they lay out the, uh, the contest parameters, who you have to be, how long your, your story has to be, no more than 7,500 words. And they also lay out 
basic parameters of the story, which Sondra Marashek and Milner Kalbreth had to do as well for Star Trek The New Voyages, especially when the first volume of Star Trek The New Voyages uh, sold. It sold really, really, really well, and so there had to be a second volume. So they had to start laying out rules. One of the rules that applies, some of the rules are the same. One of the rules that applies here as well as it did then is no explicit sex. No erotica. And, I don't know, someone who's new to the world of fan fiction might think you don't need to say that, but as we've already covered on Book Trek, you do need to say that. Fan fiction of all kinds, the minute fans get going on fan fiction, it seems like one of the first things they want to do with any property, not just Star Trek, is immediately launch into erotica, slash fiction, that sort of thing. So the, uh, uh, Dean Le Wesley Smith here, the editor and the whole editorial team, they had to lay out the rules, no sex. And another rule that very much carries over from the old... Uh, Strange new, uh, new voyages from the old the old fan anthology series was no Mary Sue characters, which for those of you who remained out of the culture wars blissfully, uh, Ma a Mary Sue character refers to a new character invented a character invented by the author, who easily outdoes all of the old characters and saves the day. This was considered this was coined a Mary Sue. I don't know where that term came from. It's possible that Sondra Marshak and Mary Culbreth coined it, but it was it's. It's obvious Genesis was in the, the urge for amateur writers to insert themselves into their fiction. An author insert is another term for what it's called here. An author insert in modern-day science fiction, in modern-day fantasy, in modern-day literary fiction, especially in modern-day comic books, will only ever be a Mary Sue. They are, so they're pretty much the same. No one ever inserts themselves into a story just to see their face. Like once upon a time, Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum used to do in X-Men stories. They would put themselves in the background. But just to see their face, not so they could save the day. <laughs> no one ever does that anymore. Now if you insert yourself into a story you are implying or you are going to have the story outright state, that the universe needs you to save it. Uh, that Mr. Spock is going to fumble at his science station until you, say, until you walk by and just casually say, Ah, oh, oh, and you, know, you might want to check that. You know, don't forget to be awesome. Uh, these... Anthologies all say that, and this, this series doesn't exist anymore. There isn't, this is number 9, I think if this went up to 10 or 11 or 12, but there isn't, you know, number 30. This isn't still going on 30, and it's not because they wouldn't get in, uh, submissions. One of the reasons why this, no, this is no longer going, at least, I shouldn't say that. I don't actually know the industry reasons why this isn't going anymore. There's certainly the raw material for it. I think one of the fundamental changes that would have to be made if this were done now is that uh, one of the rules at the back of the book would have to be only Mary Sue's <laughs> because the industry has changed. Now, if you don't like the Mary Sue, you're a sexist or you are a, a guardian of the patriarchy you know, or something like that or you're a Trump supporter or an arch conservative because why shouldn't a new person with no training, no ability, no experience outdo all of the, the experienced hands all around them? Why shouldn't they do it? Don't forget to be awesome. Uh, that is now rampant everywhere. Mary Sue's are everywhere in movies especially but also in comic books and in lots and lots of novels where if you're transcribing your Twitter feed to make something that you're going to call a work of fiction, of course you're going to be both a self-insert character and a Mary Sue. So these books, if they came out now, would have to say, not no Mary Sues, but only Mary Sues. <laughs> That's all you can do. Because the rest of these characters are all sexist, they're all racist, they're all, you know, transphobes and xenophobes. So they come from a time before you had a Twitter account. So they must be, say it with me now, literally worse than Hitler. Uh, but <laughs> it, it, that was the obtaining rule in these volumes when they came out. These are, I think, 20 years old now. Uh, and another, uh, another couple of rules dealt with canon, which I find very interesting, and that certainly don't apply on fanfiction.net and places like it. W one of those canon rules was you can't have your story be entirely about a character who's never mentioned on Star Trek. No matter how exciting your story is, for instance, uh, uh, well, I don't even know. The the uh, settlement of Omicron Seti 3, right? The, 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 from the episode This Side of Paradise, the original episode This Side of Paradise. There is a, a human settlement on the planet Omicron Seti 3. Seems like an ideal place. It's M-class. There doesn't appear to be any uh, indigenous wildlife of any kind. So a human colony is set up there to get back to their roots. Very little technology, mostly agrarian that sort of thing. And 
when the Enterprise finds the colony, something has changed. The, the humans there don't even have their appendix scars. Their, their appendixes have grown back. And they seem oddly benumbed, like they're living in a dream. And it quickly becomes obvious in the course of that episode that there is a native life form, or maybe not, maybe it's not native to the planet, spores. They're these big, creeping plants that seem capable of stealth, so maybe they're intelligent, and they emit psychogenic, psychotropic spores that uh, remove all conflict. They create a very benign uh, frame of mind, a very benign communal cooperation, and in exchange, they render human bodies immune to Berthold radiation, which would otherwise kill humans on the planet. Uh, and we see what that process is like. We see that it, it changes you. you. You go from being a normal person with conflicts and wants and desires to being a blander, more zoned-out version of yourself. You can't set a story for one of these anthologies among that original settlement. On Omicron SETI 3, you can't set this in a merchant shop on the planet Argalius where the merchant is having trouble with his customers and also with a local protection racket. With no mention of the Federation, no mention of any Starfleet or Star Trek character, you can't do that. There are plenty of stories that can be told that way, and fan fiction has told a million of them, but you can't do it for one of these. And another big canonical exclusion here is that you can't violate canon. You can't kill a canonical character, you can't bring a, cano a dead canonical character back to life, uh, at least not permanently. Or in real world, you can maybe do it in a dream. You can certainly deal, you can have dead characters speak, but not as part of, you can't reinsert them into continuity. You can't have the Enterprise be destroyed or the Federation be taken over or something like that. Very basic rules. And prizes are awarded. First, second, and third prize are awarded. And uh, these books are the result. And I read this thing, and <sighs> first of all, I didn't read it in order. I went straight to the prize winners so that I would have them in my mind when I read all the other stories. And like so many anthologies of this kind, I absolutely do not understand why the prize winners won. In some earlier, I think in Strange New Worlds number two, the first prize winner was clearly the best story in the book, by a wide margin. It was two or three, it was in the early run of these books. But here, the first prize story wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near as good as some of the stories that didn't even win prizes. And this is broken down along all of the franchises plus one extra uh, category. So we have the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Star Trek Enterprise, and then a final section on speculation, on weird oddities. They've always done that. They did that from the very first issue, where you just let your imagination go. You still have to ground it in canon, but not as closely. And I, in this in this particular issue, the first prize winner went to one of those stories. But and some of them were interesting. I, I applaud anthologies like this. But uh, you, as with any kind of anthology, you, fan fiction or not, you're going to get very uneven results. What's the matter, baby? Well, what you doing? You want to hop up on your couch to see your your fans can see you? Come on, come up here. Come on. Come on. Go on up so your fans can see you. Here you go. <laughs> uh, she doesn't probably want to stay up there because it's probably pretty warm. It's a pretty warm day. Uh, one of the stories here, the stories from the original series are completely forgettable, except for one of those fantasy stories that uh, is set in the original series, but it isn't part of that. It's a speculation, so it's not part of that first segment. There's a, a story by Paul Seng T. S-E-N-G, called Staying the Course, that's set when uh, Worf is Chancellor of the Klingon Empire, and a group of terrorists want, are demanding that he hand over his son Alexander, who is now an ambassador for the Federation, or they will destroy all life form on a planet. And Worf has to sort of confer with, with John Luke Picard, calls him John Luke. He's so, he's so overwrought that he calls him John Luke. Uh, and their interactions didn't ring true at all. I know that, you know, in that story, years have passed, but it was a fascinating, it was a fascinating thing. It was a fascinating idea. I think Paul Seng made a bad miscalculation in centering the story on Worf instead of on Alexander. 
was, would have been more interesting. But I guess maybe he's thinking, or maybe it's part of one of those rules that you can't really do that. Although Alexander is part of continuity. He's part of canon. Uh, but then there was another one called uh, Terra Tonight that focused on the Federation news services. The, the uh, fourth estate, the press of the 23rd century that we see in so many different incarnations of Star Trek, but we never learn anything about them at all. We never really talk to a character who is part of the Federation news services. And this all revolves around Scotty. When the Janolan goes missing on its route to the Norpan colony, the retirement colony, eventually news trickles out of the manifest of the Janolan, and the Federation news services realize that one of the passengers was Captain Scott who served for 50 years on board the Enterprise with Captain Kirk and is a legendary figure in Starfleet. And then uh, there's also news about the launch of the Enterprise B. We get more new Federation news stories about the launch of the Enterprise B, where before he retired, Captain Scott was on board. And it was good, but I it wasn't good enough. It didn't realize its potential at all. I wanted something closer to a project that I worked on a lot myself for uh, a writing event of some kind, I don't remember what it was, which is what, what it was set in the Federation News Services. Uh, mine in, involved a crack reporter, someone who was part of the Federation News Services but didn't trust Starfleet to disseminate accurate information, wanted to dig in an investigative reporter, which we don't know if they even exist anymore in the 23rd century. It'd be pretty sad if they did. But... Uh, I had a Tellarite investigative reporter. Tellarites like to argue anyway. I figured this Tellarite doesn't take no for an answer and wants to know what's going on here. Wants to know when, when the Federation is leaking out little bits and pieces of news, how do you put them all together? Like, for instance, didn't the Federation put out news feed about James T. Kirk's enterprise being destroyed with all hands? And, okay, if that's true, if, if the Enterprise was destroyed over the Genesis planet with all hands, and the hands had to evacuate, then what was all that business of an, an emergency and illegal trip to Vulcan? And, and what was going on there? Why is Mr. Spock, why does Mr. Spock seem so weird? And why does the Enterprise have records of him having a funeral? and them jettisoning a photon torpedo casing tube with his body in it into space. If that's true, then how come the Federation's own news feed services are showing him saving the whales at, at the Golden Gate Bridge? Is this the same, Mr. Spock? Are, are we being, is this a double? Are we being told that this is, a, that this, this is the right Mr. Spock only brought back to life? What does all of this mean? What's the real story behind all of this? <sighs> I, my my uh, Tellarite investigator tries to get to the bottom of all these things. Uh, and I, it, I, I have to say, I'm bound to say it, it was a more uh, rollicking story. It was more involving than, than uh, Terra Tonight, which clearly had the desire to be that way, but really didn't, really didn't uh, commit to the bit. Uh, and then there was, a, in the speculation part at the end, there was a story by Randy Tatano called Remembering the Future. Uh, in which Jim Kirk dies and seems to be in the actual afterlife, not, not the Nexus, although the Nexus from Star Trek Generations is all over that story, as is the Guardian of Forever. Uh, and the, the being that Jim Kirk encounters tells him, well, you have lots and lots of a future here, but you can go back to the real world to change one thing. You get one dispensation. And, uh, he makes the decision to go back to the 1930s and save Edith Keeler from dying in a street accident. Even though Mr. Spock has told him that Edith Keeler must die. That if she doesn't die, she's going to lead a peace movement in the United States that will delay America's entry into World War II, it will allow the Germans time to acquire atomic weapons, and it will consign humanity to a thousand years of autocracy, of tyranny. So although it's heartbreaking, she must die. She's supposed to die in a street accident. That's what stops it from happening. You can't save her. And the story raises fascinating doubts about whether or not the decision to 
to let Edith Keeler die was moral. Every Star Trek, every original Star Trek fan in the world loves that episode. They break, it breaks their heart every time they watch the ending. But is it the right decision? If the ending of City on the Edge of Forever is the right decision, then what happens to the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many? What happens to that? Remembering the future is is pretty good. I would have liked that. I mean, because Kirk does do it. He does go back and save Edith Keeler's life. And the, he, Mr. Spock and, Do, and Dr. McCoy are in the 1930s anyway. He has to level with them, tell them, I'm dead, I'm from the future, you have to believe me, because what I want is another option. It's a very Kirkian thing to do. I want another option. You've told me that in order to save our future, Edith Keeler must die. And that if she lives, our future is doomed. I want another option. But again, the story is over before it starts. That is a great idea for a story. And it, it's over before it starts, and I don't know if maybe that's just the 7,500 word limit. There's not much you can do in that space, unless you're really, really good. And no offense to our, to our entrance here, but none of the writers in this thing are really, really that good. And the reason I mean no offense is because Dean Wesley Smith isn't that good either. It takes a lot of work to get a lot of stuff done in 7,000 words. Uh, so this is, I don't know, my, my book track entry for last night, my book track entry for today is a little bit dull. It was a little bit dull. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, I, I might not, uh, <laughs> iPad acting up, the street acting up, the bean acting up. Uh, I might not go straight back to this, to this series of books for tonight. I don't think I will. I think I'll just spin at random again and see what I get. But uh, short story collections, they're almost bound to disappoint. And this one did. Largely disappoint. There were some things in it that were interesting. It was interesting, for instance, I, these writers, of course, didn't, I assume, didn't know each other. And were writing in different incarnations of the show, so it was kind of interesting how many times the Breen popped up. <laughs> and also Tribbles. There are Tribbles in, in two, or three, uh, two or three episodes, but the... It, the, the Terror Tonight was the one that really pulled at me the most. Because my story about the Federation News Services took off from old fan fiction ideas that posited that some of the Enterprise adventures that we see in the original series were not Enterprise adventures. They, they were, uh, excuse me, they were fictions put out to tell stories about this famous crew. So Kirk and his crew don't actually meet witches and goblins in in one episode excuse me in one episode they may meet a creature that claimed that it was once the god apollo uh but they probably don't go to a a, a, a world out there that is an exact duplicate of earth with roman gladiators they probably don't find such a word that or a world with yangs and calms they, Finding all of these identical Earths that have identical Earth histories up to a certain dividing point, that feels more like fiction. And in the early days of fan fiction, fan, Star Trek fans would say, yeah, we can make a clear distinction between which original series episodes really happened and which ones didn't. And maybe we can tell stories about why people would tell stories like that. I, my, my intrepid reporter wanted to get to the bottom of that. What, what are... Uh, that we are being told actually happened. And what actually happened that we aren't being told? What are some stories that we aren't being told here? Uh, I could have I could have stood more. I mean, I think that story could have done a lot more than it did, even in 7,000 words. Uh, but anyway, that was my... Uh, let's see if we can domesticate this thing and get another shot of it. That was my... Uh, yes, there we go. That was my book for uh, for last night. Strange New Worlds, number nine. I have all of these, so I will certainly go back to some of them before the end of Book Trek. But uh, for now, that's my Book Trek report for today. Not wowing me. Didn't blow my socks off. Not, not my socks off, but as always tonight. <laughs> I'll pick another book tonight, and we will see. So I will, I will inform you of the results tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Too.